Uh, you will note that in our Zoom room that there is a section on the bottom of your screen for chat that you can ask, you can put your questions in at that time. And then uh, Skip will be addressing those at the end of the presentation. Uh, grab your beverage and note paper so you can take some notes. You will get the PowerPoint uh, for those who would like it. The PowerPoint will be sent out with the survey at the end of this presentation. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Skip Morgan. Skip has uh, participated with our retirement series now for the last, I would say, at least four years. He's been engaged in his solo practice of law with Morgan Legal Offices, PC, and he specializes in wills, trusts, estate planning, probate and probate litigation, protective proceedings, military law, and the needs of the military family. He is past chair of the El Paso County Bar Probate Section, the Christian Legal Society, past president of the East Colorado Springs Rotary Club, and past member of the Pikes Peak Hospice and Palliative Care Board of Trustees. He is also on the board of directors for the Silver Key Foundation. Um, we are pleased and honored to have him with us today. So Skip, I'm going to turn it over to you and it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a new experience for me. I'm not going to say that Zoom is a new experience for me. Uh, I was explaining that uh, for the last six months, uh, all the court hearings have been Zoom. And, uh, and it has reached the point now where um, I would rather clean my gutters, you know, with my mouth and do another Zoom meeting. So I, I'm, I'm very gratified that some of you are willing to do this and to uh, take on this medium. Uh, so you must be really interested in, and I'm really glad of that. Um, why do I do this? Um, I mean, they've taken a survey and, and I think fully 98% uh, of all lawyers give the other 2% a bad name. So I want to try to be part of the 2% and to do something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I spent uh, 34 years in the Air Force, a good portion of that as a judge advocate. <clears throat> and one of the things that I noticed uh, in doing legal assistance over the years is that um, the failure to do estate planning can be a very expensive uh, affair. And I don't mean expensive in terms of money, but expensive, expensive in terms of emotional and familial damage. So. What I'd like to do is to tell you that there are some tickets that will give you a lawyer-free retirement. Um, and, and you have to look at a lawyer-free retirement as something which is well worth even the trouble of watching a Zoom meeting for an hour or an hour and a half. Um, and because basically it's, it's, it's like a, a very painful tetanus shot. I mean, it really hurts a lot, but it's a whole lot better than having tetanus. So with that in mind, uh, let me move forward and, and sort of give you some broad ideas about what, yeah, okay, that's a, that's a dollar bill there, that's a lawyer, and that's basically how you chum the waters for lawyers. And it being silent, I have no idea whether that works or not. <laughs> okay, let's start with the first ticket. <clears throat> Make a will and keep it up to date. Um, there's a lot of reasons to do this. Uh, many people think, well, you know, I don't have a big estate. I mean, I don't have an estate at all, so I really don't need to have a will. Um, and anyway, you know, Colorado is going to give everything to my spouse or to my children or however it looks. So really, why do I need to spend uh, the money to have a will? Okay, fair enough. Let's look at why you want to do that. The first thing is that you want your property to pass to the people you want it to go to. And there is no guarantee without a will. That, in fact, there's every likelihood that it will get your property to some of the wrong people in your life. And so the question naturally arises, who are the wrong people? Normally, I would say, all right, I'll listen to nominations for who are the wrong people. But let me start with the obvious one. That's a recent bar meeting.
the tax collector. Now I'm going to uh, give you a sneak preview. The tax collector um, today in Colorado is nothing like uh, the threat, if you will, to your estate and to your estate plans uh, that it once was. Lawyers, however, are. Uh, I'm going to talk about this later, but <clears throat> the lack of a will and the lack of, of estate planning means that you have a lot of open questions that are unfortunately only going to be decided in court. So <clears throat> the greatest amount of litigation uh, that I have seen in the last 20 years of doing this here in Colorado um, has to do with when there isn't a will. Uh, and that leads to litigation as to whether there is something which is like a will, uh, whether who is in the family for principles of intestacy and so forth. And the one thing I'm sure without knowing any of you out there that I can be certain of is that none of you have in mind uh, making lawyers the beneficiary of your estate. And then the last one I sort of call uh, assorted crumb bums who are not on your Christmas card list. And uh, uh, pr primary nominees for this particular group are an ex-spouse, um, a stepchild, uh, other distant relatives um, who you've not had contact with and the last time you did have conflict with it was when they got thrown out of the last family reunion. So all of these people are potential beneficiaries of your estate um, if you don't have a will. And with a will, you can make fairly certain that none of them become beneficiaries of your estate. There's another reason that I think is very important. And that is <clears throat> Colorado has a really nifty law. Uh, and the law is, um, deals with a personal property memorandum. Most wills, to sort of oversimplify, um, say, I leave everything to my wife if she survives me, and if not, then to the children in equal shares. And that's relatively straightforward for an intact nuclear family, uh, which sadly is becoming increasingly rare. Um, but that doesn't take care of stuff. I actually have a visual aid that I'd like to show everybody. This is a model of an A26. It's hand carved, it's made out of wood, and it is the A26 that my father uh, flew in World War, or rather in the Korean War. He won the Silver Star flying that. Now its actual value is kind of a work of art, I guess, is something. But to somebody like me, it's priceless. Uh, it's priceless because you can't cut that in half or in thirds and split it among the children. The personal property memorandum enables you to do that. And the way it does it is all you have to have in your will is a reference that I'm going to have a personal property memorandum. And then that memorandum can be done it can be done on a legal scratch pad. There's no particular format. Uh, there's no requirement for notarization or witnessing or anything. And it can become possibly the most important aspect of your will. I had a case a while back um, where there were uh, three kids and the estate was worth $3 million. It sounds pretty easy, um, but the, uh, the family, um, had, they were Russian, uh, at least in extraction, and so they had really made uh, a big deal of collecting Russian artifacts, nested dolls and triptychs and all of that sort of thing. And these three kids fought tooth and nail over every single doll, artifact, and what have you. It is no exaggeration to say that they spent so much money doing that that they could have probably purchased the whole thing. I had another couple of brothers who fought 
in their father's estate and probably spent $30,000 in attorney's fees just to get dad's Hot Wheel collection. That's a very expensive Hot Wheel collection. So what I always recommend, because when the, when the surviving parent dies, <laughs> there is um, a very unfortunate but completely understandable um, sort of a dynamic that takes place is, is that kids, even those who nominally get along, um, suddenly this family Bible or this photo album or this baby blanket or something else like that becomes of enormous importance because it's, it's what dad had. It's what he touched. Now, it was, uh, it was precious. And those sorts of things can be so important. Um, so anticipating that, uh, what I always recommend that, that people do who are my estate planning clients is to bring the kids in at the next 4th of July or Thanksgiving or what have you and say, you know, um, mom and dad may have some things that are particularly important to you, a piece of jewelry or, or what have you. Um, let's identify those now. And you're going to get this. You're going to get, oh, mom, that is so morbid. That is so sick. I don't want anything. And uh, I will give you the correct response to that is none of you are too big to be spanked. So have them identify those things and you put that down in writing and you will save the child that you have selected to be your personal representative one of the greatest burdens possible and that is the burden of simultaneously being uh, a beneficiary, uh, a contestant, uh, an umpire, and ultimately the judge. Because kids will fight over the darndest things. You don't want your personal representative to be handling the tangible personal property because it's relatively speaking a small part of your of most estates, but it can occupy the most amount of time and money and 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 interfamily stress. It's also a way to keep heirlooms in the family. Um, you may have three boys. Um, and you may have jewelry that's come down through the, through the women's side of the family, through the wife's and the mother's side of the family, and you don't want that to go outside of the family. So you may say, look, this, I want this piece to go to my niece or somebody like that so that you can make sure that uh, heirlooms stay in the family from which they came. If that's the most important thing, this may be the most, the second most important thing. Um, and that's to harmonize your probate and your non-probate assets. Now I apologize if this sounds a little bit legally, but it is vitally important that you do this. When you say in your will, I have five kids, um, four boys and a girl. When you say in your will, everything to my spouse, and if my spouse doesn't survive me to the kids in equal shares, uh, which is again, a typical way of handling things, you must be terribly certain that your non-probate assets harmonize with your probate. Okay, what's the difference? Anything you own in your own name, usually, is going to be a probate asset with the most important exception being IRAs, 401ks and annuities. IRAs and 401ks, which for many of us represent the most important or the largest signal portion of what's in our estate, do not pass by will. Let me underscore that. They do not pass by will. You can make your estate the beneficiary of an IRA or 401k, but the income tax consequences of doing that are, are punishing. 
uh, because the IRS takes the position that an estate is like a person in the highest income tax bracket. So an IRA that's throwing off uh, interest and dividends and so forth is going to be taxed at the 40% level. So you can literally take your IRA or 401k and cut it by 40% just by making your estate the beneficiary. So with that in mind, your IRA and 401k and 403b administrators are always going to say you need to have a beneficiary designated on that. If your spouse is still living, typically that's what you're going to do. But then you want to make sure if the spouse does not survive you to put down there, in my case, it would be all five children in equal shares. That does a lot of things. First of all, it makes things easy. Secondly, it harmonizes with what I'm doing in my will. And third, it minimizes the income tax consequences. Because what happens is with a beneficiary, particularly for a spouse, the spouse can essentially roll it over into her own um, IRA or 401k. But for even for non-spouse, they've got a certain amount of time in which to withdraw uh, what's in that IRA <clears throat> and, uh, and take income taxes over a longer period of time. Now, it's, it's beyond the scope of what I'm doing today to get into uh, you know, strategies for IRAs and 401ks and, and tax consequences. But the important thing to remember is this. They, are, they pass by beneficiary designation and not by your will. So that if a major portion of your will or, or of your IRA um, or your state is in an IRA and you don't have the same distribution as your will, that will not count. So for example, suppose you have a $100,000 estate and you have $100,000 um, in, uh, in, in an IRA uh, and you want your estate to go to uh, in equal shares to your three children. Okay, so they each get $33,000. But the amount that they get will be determined upon what's in your probate estate. And the IRAs will not count against it. So anybody who takes a share from an IRA or a 401k is not going to count against their share from your will. Um, joint tenancy are the same ways. A joint tenancy, and, and many of you, particularly those of you, you know, who are married, um, have your accounts in joint tenancy with right of survivorship. And that means just what it is implied, and that is that if one spouse passes away, the other takes everything that's in that particular account without uh, I mean, without any probate or anything else, all they do is a death certificate is all that is required. Some people say, well, in order to make things easy for my kid who's got my power of attorney and maybe is, uh, is my personal representative, I'm going to set up an account in joint tenancy for them. So I'm going to have a checking account that normally has maybe twenty or $30,000 in it, and I'm going to make my oldest son guy, a uh, joint tenant with me so that he can take care of me um, if something happens. Problem with that is that if I die tomorrow, guy gets the $30,000 and it does not count against his one-fifth share. So that's important. Tangible personal property, I have already talked about, that's in your probate estate. A tenancy in common is in your probate state. Why does that matter? At around the year 2000, the late 90s, early 2000s, um, there was uh, the, the federal estate tax was right at a million dollars. Uh, it eventually went up to 3 million and I'll get to where it is now. But as property grew, um, a major portion of your estate, of your taxable estate, could actually be uh, the house that you lived in, the marital, marital property. 
Um, and so some estate planning lawyers severed the joint tenancy and had a tenancy in common. Um, the, the, the time for the usefulness of tenancy in common between husband and wife in the, in the marital home, the family home, has come and gone. But some people didn't change it back. And that, unfortunately, too often means that if dad passes away first, and you know we guys always pass away first, um, if dad passes away first, we have to open a probate just to get the other half of the house in the name of mom. So for those of you in that situation, it is worth it for you to review the deed that you have, and, it's a, and you can get one from the, if you don't have your own, you should, but review the deed that you have and make sure that it says joint tenancy and not tenancy in common. Okay, that is a lot, but it is so important because you can, by doing beneficiary designation, which is another non-probate asset. So if you have a payable on death uh, CD uh, or savings account or something, that too will pass according to who your beneficiary is and will not count against that beneficiary share in your will. So you wanna make sure that if something happens to you tomorrow, that the probate and non-probate estate assets will pass uh, and come up with the, uh, with the result that you wanted. Okay, taxes. Um, I used to spend a lot of time on this in Colorado. Uh, however, uh, as we stand here today, uh, for those of you who are married, you are going to need over $23 million in your estate um, before we have to concern ourselves with the state taxes uh, or a single person, $11,580,000. If there's anybody within the sound of my voice right now who has that problem, stop everything right now and call me. But I'm betting there isn't anybody. Since the applicable exclusion of that, which you kind of think of as the deductible, since that's gone away, um, essentially there is no estate tax anymore. Colorado used to have an inheritance tax. In fact, it's still on the books. But when the Tax Reform Acts were passed, uh, and, and what Colorado did and what most states did is they said, um, there was a credit in the federal estate tax for the money that you paid in a state inheritance tax or transfer tax. And every single state had this language in so many, whatever the maximum credit is on your federal estate tax return, send it to us. Um, generally speaking, the maximum credit was 7% of the uh, estate tax, so essentially, 93% of your final estate tax bill would go to the feds and 7% would go to Colorado. Congress didn't like that. They wanted all of the money to go to them. So there now is no longer a state inheritance tax credit. So uh, some states have gone on and enacted their own inheritance and transfer taxes. Um, some of you, uh, and, but Colorado is not one of those. Colorado is probably the best uh, state in the union in terms of probation, in terms of probate, its ease and its simplicity, uh, and in terms of taxes. That's not true for all states, mind you. Um, some, some of you may remember the, and I don't know if they still have it or not, but New Hampshire had a, uh, a license plate that had their motto on it, which was live free or die. Um, and it is true, in fact, that New Hampshire doesn't have an income tax. However, they have a punitive inheritance tax. So truth in advertising, their plate should say, live free, but if you're starting to feel chest pains, head for Colorado, because it can be a lot of money. Another consequence of the fact that Colorado does not really have, uh, and the federal government doesn't really have a tax uh, that we need to concern ourselves is, 
a lot of people would do gifting uh, as a way to reduce um, their taxable estate and they would gift up to the maximum amount that you can give um, and that is uh, that is I think this year it's uh, fifteen thousand dollars a year but in fact that's kind of irrelevant now because fifteen thousand dollars a year it doesn't if you've got an eleven million dollar estate isn't going to do anything particularly to to reduce it and there is no gift tax I say again there is no gift tax so you can gift as much or as little as you want, but the gifting to your family or children or grandchildren is not going to have any favorable tax consequence. Um, okay. This is another important reason to have a will. Um, the testament part of the will is often overlooked um, but I have seen many cases, too many sadly, where there may be a child, an adult child, who is estranged. Uh, you know, somebody that's, you know, been on America's Most Wanted a couple of times, uh, you know, just has been a, uh, an outcast from, from the family for a long time. And it is very natural, I think, for when we do estate planning and parents to say, well, why should they get anything from my estate? They have been uh, unpleasant, they have been unkind, they have been unloving, they have not been in communication. When that happens, I often tell them this. If you do that, and you of course can do that, it's easy to do, um, the one guaranteed result that I can give you is that it will permanently sever whatever relationship your children had with each other and with this, with this outcast. Um, they won't talk to each other except through lawyers. Um, if there's going to be a will contest, the black sheep, uh, the one that's been taken out of the will, has nothing to lose. Uh, at all. And therefore, sometimes it will be challenged on that basis. But the most important one is family reconciliation, because if you stop and think about it, cutting one of your children out of the will means that the other children will bear the brunt of your vengeance. Uh, you won't have to deal uh, with what happens afterwards. And I can't tell you how many um, adult children have said, I would rather you give it to him and have a little bit less money than he turn his wrath on me. Um, so that is something to always take into consideration. Uh, will this make it this person a better person? No, probably not. Uh, will the money be spent wisely? Possibly not, but will you have given the rest of your children an opportunity for healing and, and reconciliation? Yeah, yeah, you will. So don't forget the testament part of the will. This is another aspect that is underappreciated in doing estate planning. Uh, it used to be that your body, when you passed away, was considered like chattel. It was no different uh, uh, than the suit of clothes that you have. It was just a thing that was disposed of in accordance with what your personal representative decided to do. Now, in Colorado, uh, funeral and burial arrangements and organ donations are enforceable as part of the will. So, um, there are some people um, for whom the funeral and burial arrangements is of enormous importance. Um, I have clients who were, who were practicing uh, Orthodox Jews for whom it is very important that there not be involvement uh, and that there not be um, a, if you will, a, a leak-proof casket because they take seriously the portion of the Bible that says, ashes thou wert and ashes thou shalt become. So, 
having their funeral arrangements and their burial arrangements enforced is very, very important to them uh, as part of their religion. Uh, there are other religions for which burial arrangements are, are, are very important. Um, so now it's enforceable. You can specify what you want to do. Uh, you can specify um, organ donations, which is also enforceable. And some people say, well, you know, I'm old and everything, and so there'd be nothing that, uh, that would be needed or wanted. Um, actually not true. There are some, there are some things like tissue, uh, uh, like corneas, um, that can actually or, or can be transplanted, and it really doesn't seem like it matters very much um, what, uh, uh, how old you are at the time that it's done. So these are something that are very important. And, and while I'm on the subject of, of funerals and burial arrangements, uh, very personal story. Uh, my mom and dad died 16 days apart. Um, and uh, dad was not in, in, in any shape to, uh, to, to be planning mom's funeral. And it didn't help that she was Catholic and he was Presbyterian. Uh, so I did all of that. And she wanted an open casket. and. Uh, the last thing you want to hear from your sister, uh, because the stress was enormous. So mom passed away first. She wasn't supposed to. She did. Uh, and to say, well, that dress, what were you thinking when you put her in that dress? Um, again, the, there's enough pain and there's enough anguish associated with the loss of a, of a parent uh, without adding that kind of thing to it. And, and my sister didn't mean anything by it. I mean, she was probably just speaking her mind. But the more specific you can be about what you want, the easier you make it on your family, and particularly the people that you've appointed um, as your fiduciary, as your personal representative. This is another thing for some people that uh, is, is really helpful to have. <clears throat> some people may have a, a, a condo or a cabin or something like that at, at Breckenridge, or even just a, 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 you know, a family lodge out at 11 Mile. And they wanna keep it available for the family to go to as a recreational spot without giving it to any one particular person. And so you can do something like that. You can create a recreational property trust, which will keep that property in your family for them to use uh, for, a, for a long time. Um, and that's something which is really neat for children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and so forth um, to have maybe a property that's, uh, that's been an important part of their growing up um, you know, family reunions at the cabin at 11 Mile. A special needs trust is also uh, something that you can only do with a will. And what is a special needs trust or a supplemental needs trust? Um, some of you may have special needs children. Um, they uh, may be receiving Medicaid uh, as a result of, what, uh, of their disability, whatever that might be. And you may know that if you pass and they simply take a lot of, uh, uh, take a lot of money, you, that will knock them off the Medicaid rolls. And knocking them off the Medicaid rolls, uh, you know, can be very, very expensive. The, the law allows for something called a special needs trust that allows you to put money in trust for that child. Um, and it will not count against them in terms of their eligibility for Medicaid and for other kinds of public assistance. Now, there's a limited number of things that you can do with that money. But at least if you put it in a special needs trust, it won't automatically strike them from the rules. And handling blended families. Um, like it or not, more and more of our families are blended. So you may have children, his, hers, and ours. And you want to make sure when you have that situation <laughs> that the children of the first to die uh, don't lose their parents' um, portion, if you will, of the estate. Because if you have a will, which basically says everything to my spouse, and if she survives me, and then to my children in equal shares, if the spouse survives, uh, then her will is going to control what happens at her death. 
And that's going to mean usually or often that, that her, her children take, but his never do. Um, and so there's a way to handle that in, in creating a will and doing estate planning to make sure that doesn't matter who passes away first, all of the children of both husband and wife will be treated fairly. Okay, so will all matters. No will. What does that mean? Well, it means that state law governs who gets your estate. Um, the laws of intestacy are relatively straightforward where you have an intact uh, family. But if you have a blended family, it's not as, uh, as easy to do. And what it can mean in practical terms is that without a will and your spouse passes away having other children is that uh, his children could become your co-tenants in the house, um, something that most of us uh, don't want to have happen. So again, in the case of blended families, it is vitally important um, that you have a will. Okay, there's a legal presumption that the spouse will be the principal, but not the exclusive heir. You can, in your will, um, disinherit anybody that you want. That's not true in all states, but you, there is no right as a child to take any share of the parent's estate. Um, no right as uh, brothers or sisters or parents or anything else like that. The only one you cannot disinherit is a spouse. Um, and, and that means that if you say, look, uh, you know, even though we're still married here, uh, we've been separated and so forth. And so I'm just going to give everything to my kids and not to my spouse. Not so fast. Um, you have to, that, that spouse can do something called an elective share, meaning uh, in so many words, getting 50% of, of the estate, uh, no matter what the will says. Uh, and is also always entitled to a family allowance, which is $65,000, or rather, um, uh, yeah, $65,000 and an exempt property allowance, which is another $65,000. So those come right off the top without going into this year. It also means that children under the laws of intestacy, uh, even those of a previous marriage uh, or an estranged family will take equally. Uh, regardless of your relationship, and maybe you never, maybe you have children from a previous relationship that you've not had contact with, uh, that are uh, under the guardianship or custody, if you will, of the other parent, those children will take uh, their share of the estate. Um, as I said, you can find your stepchildren becoming your co-tenants. And a personal property memorandum without a will is not enforceable. And for those of you who have children who are minors, the state's going to decide who gets your children, not you. And remember always that without a will, non-probate beneficiary designations will always be, uh, will always trump. And so you may have a very distorted uh, distribution because of the beneficiary designations that you may have. Uh, this is important too. Uh, even if you are an intact nuclear family, husband and wife, children, and so forth, without a will, you don't have a personal representative. And, and too many times I see when that happens, you may have several children who want to be the personal representative, which is the executor. Not sure why they want to be, but um, because you don't have a will that designates who that's going to be, you can often find yourself in court over who's going to be the personal representative. And that's never good. And probate administration, because of that, can become more expensive. Now, understand this, and, this, and I probably should have added this. I may have alluded to this earlier, but Colorado um, has the easiest fastest, least expensive probate system in the country, for real. Um, and <clears throat> done the way I do wills, and, and most competent estate planning attorneys do wills, 
There is no probate as you understand the term. It is a matter of lodging the original will uh, downtown at the El Paso County Probate Registrar, filing several papers. I can do that online. And within a week to 10 days, the will is, is probated. It's that easy. I can often probate a will faster than you can get a death certificate. That's how simple it's become. It's administrative process in Colorado. Having a will uh, is actually easier and cheaper than not having one. All right, I talked a long time about the will. Let's talk about the general durable springing power of attorney. And let's define some terms. What does durable mean? Um, a little history lesson. At the common law, a general power of attorney or a power of attorney would empower the agent, person you point as a power of attorney, to do everything that you could do, including things that you may not want them to do because uh, there are two legal use. But that would also mean that if you no longer had capacity if you suffer from a stroke or, or dementia or what have you, your agent would be disabled because if you didn't have capacity, then your agent didn't have capacity. Well, uh, you know intuitively that that sort of defeats the purpose. So all of the states enacted laws making powers of attorney durable. And that means they survive your incapacity, which is the very reason that you want them. As long as you have capacity, you're the boss of you. Um, but if you don't, then you want somebody to be able to step up and to have full authority to do what needs to be done. That's what durable means. It means it survives your incapacity. Um, back during WW Nam, before we went uh, over to, to Vietnam, uh, all of the JAGs would make sure that we had durable powers, powers of attorney. Um, and and so they, you know, they had forms and they were done. And guys would come back to find that they'd been divorced in absentia uh, by their wife who had run away with somebody and was um, and had, had divorced them, married them, uh, gotten themselves child support and alimony and so forth. And they did all that with a power of attorney. Um, that didn't seem fair. So now we have something called a springing power of attorney. And springing means that it only comes into effect at your incapacity. Very important. So there's never two legal yous running around on this planet. It is only in the event that you lack capacity. Again, be, whether it's a stroke or, or sometimes it's blindness, uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, and so forth. The only time the power of attorney comes into effect is when you can't handle things yourself for whatever reason. Um, such a thing is a key element in disability planning. Uh, a good portion of my practice deals with families where one or the other member of the family is starting to suffer from dementia or Alzheimer's or something where they're simply no longer able to take care of themselves. If they don't have a durable springing power of attorney, um, it is often the case that unfortunately you end up in court and you have to appoint a conservator. Uh, the court proceedings are not easy, they're not cheap, and they're not quick uh, to do that. And eventually the court will appoint somebody to manage your money. Um, so a durable springing power of attorney avoids a conservatorship. And it gives the, your loved ones, the people that you trust to, to take care of you, uh, the maximum amount of flexibility to do things that are in your best interest and to not have to go in front of a judge and, uh, and ask for permission um, to do all kinds of things that you otherwise would be able to do. There's also some judicial protection um, from, doing, uh, from, from abusing a power of attorney. And unfortunately, there are cases where people with a power of attorney do abuse it. Uh, we have a whole series of laws that can bring them uh, to bar 
if they in fact abscond with money uh, or do self-dealing or start gifting to themselves. Important for long-term care planning. Again, we don't, uh, some people think, well, you know, I'm not that old, I don't need a will or anything um, like that. But the odds are somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to one that you will suffer at some point in your life some disability of some kind, as opposed to, quote, premature death. So long-term care planning uh, and incapacity, a general durable springing power of attorney is essential. And in that power of attorney, you can say, look, I don't want to have a guardian or a conservator, but if I do, uh, this is who I want. And that does make it easier uh, in the event that a, that a guardianship or a conservatorship is necessary. Okay, so you can transfer, lease, or mortgage real estate. Sometimes uh, it's necessary for uh, an elderly parent to, uh, to downsize and to move into assisted living or perhaps memory care. With the power of attorney, you'll be able to handle that usually. You can pay taxes. It gives you Medicaid planning flexibility. Um, there are some people that may require uh, a Medicaid bed for long-term care. Um, and when that happens, uh, there are very strict requirements having to do with income and resources, savings and so forth. But there are certain trusts that you can create, a Miller Income Trust that can keep your eligibility for Medicaid um, um, even though your income, and I stress income, may be too high. Uh, this is not a, a Medicaid uh, trust that hides resources, uh, hides your savings and so forth. That uh, gets into the realm of the criminal. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a Medicaid income trust. And then you can also purchase community spouse annuities. When somebody has to go uh, to a nursing home and requires long-term care, um, that doesn't mean that the, the other spouse, the healthy or well spouse, if you will, has to be impoverished in order for that, uh, for Medicaid to kick in. Uh, there are certain things that you can do, and one of those with the power of attorney is to, is to purchase uh, a community spouse annuity. And of course, contracting for long-term care. The story about, you know, be nice to your kids because they'll be picking out your nursing home. Yeah. Uh, and it's with the power of attorney that they do that. And I talked about downsizing. Gifting is also possible, although as I mentioned earlier, um, that's not something that typically uh, is important anymore in powers of attorney. And there is obviously very good reason not to allow gifting um, in uh, any power of attorney. Um, this is a little excursion that I like to make. Uh, VA aid and attendance. Um, many of the nursing homes have somebody there uh, when you're trying or assisted living or what have you or memory care and you're trying to check in maybe an elderly parent or something, and they'll say, well, um, you know, dad was a veteran during a certain period of time, and so you can get uh, up to $2,000 a month in uh, VA aid and attendance. And uh, that sounds like it's too good to be true, and often not, it is too good to be true. <clears throat> what they do is, and there is such a thing, mind you, as VA aid attendance, but it, like Medicaid, is resource dependent. You can't be making too much money, and you can't have too much money. Um, and so making too much money is not as important because VA aid attendance is that portion of your income that which, which constitutes unreimbursed medical expenses. It's not just a flat amount of 2000 uh, but what these people do is they, you may have a house, they may have a few hundred thousand dollars. They will say, hey, we're going to put you on, on with this attorney and he's going to um, do a, a trust for you, an irrevocable trust, 
that will put all of your assets into a trust. And that way you won't have too many assets um, in order to qualify for BAA and aid attendance. Well, what they do is you sign off on that trust and suddenly you are genuinely penniless. Uh, everything goes uh, into this trust. Uh, it's irrevocable, you can't take it back. And then they, the trustee, who's always this attorney or this company, uh, liquidate everything you have. Uh, and then they go ahead and they um, buy certain kinds of uh, stocks and products and everything where there is a huge upfront loading cost. It is uh, the closest thing to criminal that you can get. Um, so if somebody approaches you with something like this, please, please, please don't sign up for anything or have mom or dad sign up for anything until you've had an opportunity to talk to a lawyer who knows about VAA in attendance. All right, ticket number three, medical durable power of attorney. This does what, just what it, it implies, it appoints an agent for you for all medical decisions. Um, and once again, it only comes into effect if you are not able to communicate for yourself. Um, and it can be anything. Uh, you, if you are in an automobile accident and, uh, and your husband or wife comes to the hospital and says, how is my darling spouse? They won't even tell you that your darling spouse is there unless you have a medical power of attorney. Doesn't matter that you're married. Uh, that does not confer any, uh, any automatic authority on you. So it's vital that you have something like this so that if you're no longer temp temporarily or otherwise uh, able to make decisions for yourself, um, then at least somebody has the legal authority to do that. Uh, I talk about the perils of HIPAA. I had a case where a uh, woman was suffering from dementia, it was fairly severe, and she was beginning to elope. Uh, if, uh, if, and elope is the term for just, just leaving home or wherever she would go, she would just wander the streets and would then of course get hopelessly lost. Well, she did that one night, her husband looked everywhere for her, couldn't find her. Um, and so he started calling around uh, to hospitals, uh, police stations, fire stations, any place he could possibly think of where she might be. And unfortunately, um, because of, of HIPAA, they can't confirm that she was there because he didn't have a power of attorney <laughs> at that time. Um, and it was terrible because she had gone to uh, Cedar, she'd eventually been picked up by the police had been taken to Cedar Springs and, and they asked her if she was married, and she didn't remember that she'd been married for 50 years. Um, so having this thing can be absolutely vital. And it can avoid a court-ordered guardianship. With a medical power of attorney, and, uh, that's what is the equivalent of a guardianship. You can make those medical decisions for a loved one uh, and avoid what are called protective proceedings that can be expensive and divisive. You don't want a guardianship and a conservatorship if you can save yourself doing that by having powers of attorney. And then, as I said, you're the boss of you until you're not. Um, I'm gonna talk about the last ticket, which is a what's called a living will. But it's always important to know that it uh, doesn't matter what a piece of paper says, as long as you have the capacity to communicate with your doctor or your care providers, what you say goes and not what your power of attorney says and not what one of the children that you may have appointed as a power of attorney says. So that's very important. You are a, uh, you are a person, a sovereign person, and you maintain that sovereignty uh, until such time as you are no longer able to exercise it. All right, living well. Last ticket. A living will is not a living trust. Uh, it is not a do not resuscitate order. 
it is instructions, instructions to your doctor uh, about what you want to do and what you don't want to do in the event that you are uh, in extremis. Um, and I will just use kind of the example of the ones that I do. Um, typically, there are four criteria in a living will. One, I'm unconscious, in a coma, or other, otherwise unable to make or communicate my decisions. Two, I suffer from a terminal disease or condition. Three, my physician and one other physician certify the first two in writing. And four, I have been in this condition for seven days or more. It can be any amount, but the nominal, the nominal figure is usually seven days. Then in so many words, pull the plug. Now it's obviously it's kind of a legalese and it doesn't say pull the plug. But one of the things that uh, happens uh, when that seven days is up is that, that feeding and hydration, that is to say food and water, will be withdrawn. And what that means in practical medical terms uh, is that that's going to be the proximate cause of your death. It's going to be lack of feeding, it's going to be dehydration. Uh, and I can, and I, and I know this not only from experience, but my daughter is a, is a physician. Um, and for some people, particularly those people who, uh, uh, Catholics and others who were very, very concerned about this, uh, are concerned that the withdrawal of nourishment and hydration is a form of suicide. Um, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm saying that people feel that way having a living will, which is at odds with your personal belief system can be a problem. Here's what I do in that. Um, I don't want a doctor or doctors uh, to, to be looking at the second hand on the clock and watch it sweep across the 12 uh, to end the seventh day in your life and then just turn everything off. I want them to deal with the people who know you and love you and value your belief system. Um, and I'll give you an example. Uh, had a, had a, uh, a client, a woman, and I did my normal living will, and uh, years later, she suffered a, a terrible stroke, a massive stroke, and she was in a coma. And uh, she remained in a coma for seven days, seven nights. And the doctors approached her daughter who had her medical power of attorney and said, you know, we, we have this living will here. We think that the criteria have been met. Uh, maybe it's time to let mom go. And the daughter said, you know, I've been talking with mom every, every night. And I've been holding her hand and talking with her. And last night, she squeezed my hand. She squeezed my hand twice. Let's wait a little bit longer. Well, they did. And the woman made a full recovery. Uh, and I don't mean just a vegetative kind of existence. She lived for another year and a half um, of, of quality of life, visiting with her children or, and her grandchildren and so forth. So a living will is a directive to your doctors, but I always like to make sure that your family, the people you love and who love you back are in that loop. And of course it complements, it doesn't replace the medical power of attorney. The medical power of attorney is for all kinds of conditions uh, that you may be temporarily sidelined. Uh, the, the living will is essentially for end of life decisions. Kava has something which is called a medical order for scope of treatment. It's a most form. Um, and there are other things called the five wishes and so forth. Uh, and those are things that you may fill out uh, when you enter in a hospital. And those can very well be a do not resuscitate order. A, a living will is not a do not resuscitate order. Um, and so it's important that you keep those distinct. Okay, looking at the time. 
Um, appointing fiduciaries, very, very important. Um, fiduciary is a highfalutin legal term that means somebody who represents you and who is bound to represent your interest and not their own. Uh, I like this, uh, not honesty alone, but the punctilio of an honor the most sensitive is the standard of behavior. Who are fiduciaries? Well, for estate planning purposes, they are our executors or personal representatives. That's one fiduciary. Uh, the people that we appoint um, as our powers of attorney. And, and typically, uh, and when you do a power of attorney, you're going to have a primary and then have a backup because you don't want to, uh, you want to just kind of build that insurance in there. Um, what they do is vital. Uh, strangely enough, a personal representative is probably or can be the, the least crucial of all of the um, uh, fiduciaries that you might have because personal representative is very much bound by the terms of the will. Uh, and, uh, and even though uh, administration of an estate in Colorado is easy and it's informal, nevertheless, the will is going to control what ultimately happens. Uh, trustees are people that you may have. Um, if you have a trust for whatever reason, there are such things as testamentary trust. Uh, your guardians and your conservators and your attorneys, in fact, are fiduciaries, and, and so are lawyers. Which brings us to the question of, go back again, of who ought I to appoint? And, and some parents are uh, kind of take the position of, well, gosh, I've, you know, I've got two children, and, and uh, I think somebody, you know, they'd both be hurt if, if I appointed one over the other, and so maybe I'll just appoint them both. Can you do that? Yeah. Is that a good idea? Almost always no. And the reason for that is that um, even though they may agree on many things uh, in terms of whether to continue certain procedures or treatments in a medical power of attorney or what have you, those are emotionally supercharged decisions. And if you have two fiduciaries, they must agree. And if they don't agree, guess where you end up? Uh, often in court. And there are a lot of agencies that if you have co-fiduciaries are going to expect both of them to sign everything that you have. And uh, that can be really cumbersome. So my recommendation, uh, I used to say kind of flippantly, you know, pick the kids you hate because it's a lot of work. Um, but what I really mean to say is, if you have a number of children who are, uh, you, you know the dynamic. Uh, every one of us is a child of God and we have a different soul and, and different attitude and so forth. And my feeling is you choose the, for your personal representative, the child that gets along best. Doesn't have to be an accountant, doesn't have to be the lawyer, doesn't have to be any of those things. Can be living in a van down by Monument Creek. But if they get along best with their siblings, that's the right choice. Because they're probably going to see a lawyer, and a lawyer is going to help coach them through this. But um, having somebody like that is really invaluable. Um, is it important that your fiduciary be in, um, be in Colorado? Increasingly not. Uh, with cell phones and WebEx and Zoom and text and so forth, uh, you can be on the other side of the planet and still be available for on a real time basis uh, to, uh, to make decisions. So that's a word on fiduciaries. I've added this and it's kind of a, a catalog of horrors. What if, what if nobody finds the original will? Maybe you have it in a safe deposit box and nobody knows it's there. That really fast probate that I told you about, it's out the window unless you have the original will. If you don't have the original will, you're gonna to go to court. What if nobody knows about a disabled spouse? There are uh, very tragic cases that I have seen over the years 
um, where one uh, of an elderly couple has a dementia um, as a statistical probability, more often that person is the woman, the wife, and the husband is covering for her, uh, making sure that meals are prepared, making sure that medicines are taken when they should be taken and in the dosage that they should be taken, uh, getting them to and from appointments and doctor's appointments and so forth. And maybe the kids are spread all across the planet and they don't know this. They don't know that mom's suffering because she can put on a pretty good front when she's on the telephone for a few minutes. Um, and they don't know how far things have gone. And then one day, dad, and this happened just recently, dad suffered a stroke, uh, collapsed, uh, was able to get 911 before he was completely out of it. They came, they took him away, they put him in the hospital. Mom was left there in the house having no clue what has just happened. And they find her three days later in the living room floor. That's a horrible situation. Uh, and that's why keeping your family informed about this sort of thing is absolutely critical because if something happens to you, you don't want mom or dad to fall into a vacuum. More and more of us are banking online. We have investment accounts and brokerage accounts online. We buy CDs and the only thing that, is, uh, that, that tells us about that is our computer. Well, if something happens and one of the kids, the adult kids has to come in there and do this, how do they know where you have accounts, how much is in them, who your broker is, who your banker is? Um, more and more of us do this online. You need to keep a list of user IDs and passwords. Because if you trust one of the kids enough to make them your power of attorney and to make them your personal representative, by golly, you better trust them enough to give them your user ID and passwords. Because without that, they can be almost helpless. And it can take a long time to sort out an estate um, if this sort of information is not readily available. What if the primary care physician isn't known? What if everything's in the safety deposit box and nobody knows that it's there? So people ask, what do I do with my original will? Well, um, one place to put it is a safety deposit box. But if you do that, it's important that one, the bank or credit union that has the safety deposit box knows that your will is in there. Two, that your fiduciaries know that, the, that their documents are in there. Three, that those fiduciaries have the ability to get into that safety deposit box. So you put them in as having access. If they need a key, you make sure that they would have access to a key. And then life insurance policy that nobody knows about. Um, there is not a central database which says that if Skip Morgan uh, is run over by the, uh, the BFI truck tomorrow, uh, the insurance companies are not notified and, and they don't suddenly send something say, oh, Morgan, Morgan, let, oh yeah, we've got a big insurance policy on him. Let's call up his widow and tell her that she just hit the jackpot. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, so keeping a list of insurance policies or any kind of policies, long-term care policies, uh, healthcare policies and so forth is so important so that your fiduciaries can take advantage of them. Uh, so what, when I do estate planning, I give you this smart book and you can sort of fill it out. And there's a lot of homework associated with doing that, but it can be of inestimable value uh, if something happens and you need to, uh, uh, to have one of your fiduciaries step up and take care of you. Okay. I'm not sure exactly how we do this, but the bonus tip is ask questions while the price is right. There, there are questions in the chat box. Skip, can you see those questions? Um, I'm gonna have to find where I find the chat box. The bottom of your screen. Maybe I need to make this smaller. Um, we could read them to you as well, Skip, if that would be easier for you. Okay, hang on. Let me see if I can. I should be able to find it. I, I thought I saw it before, but I don't see it at the bottom of my screen. Oh, there it is. Okay, I got it. Um, 
what if an inheritance is from outside of Colorado? Is that what, am I doing that right? Yes, yes, you're good. Okay, would it be subject to the other state's possible taxes? Um, great question. Answer, it depends, but usually it would only be if there is real property there. Um, I had a client uh, a few years back who um, was in New Jersey very nearly all of her life. Uh, she was actually, I'm sorry, well, she was my, my client's mother. And New Jersey is one of those states that has a real whopper of an inheritance and transfer tax. And so when that happened, uh, if she had died because she, most of her money was in a, oh, I think it was 2 million or more, uh, was in real estate. Uh, they had a, a, a farmland and a large house and everything like that. And it would have been close to a half a million dollars ta transfer taxes on that real estate because states are very jealous about real estate that's inside their borders. Um, and so if you have real estate in another state, real estate, it will be taxed by that state if they have a transfer tax. Now, what I sometimes do is if there is extensive holdings in another state, well, let me backtrack for a minute. Uh, because this is one of my favorite stories. Um, this woman moved here to Colorado that had all this property in New Jersey. And we redid her estate plan, uh, changing everything to Colorado. Um, and we redid her estate plan uh, and she was 104 years old. <laughs> so, and she didn't die till she was 107. So I calculated roughly that, that I saved the family a half a million dollars in taxes by being able to do that. So the answer is if real estate is in that other state, it is going to be taxed in accordance with that other state. If you just have bank accounts and everything and you are a domiciliary of Colorado, it will not. Um, and then I guess another question from Dennis is, uh, is it better for one's fiduciary to be in state? Uh, no, I, I mean, in a word, no, there is no advantage. I suppose in terms of the medical power of attorney, uh, that might be one where the tie goes to the, to the one that's local. But I've actually had uh, personal representatives in probated uh, entire estates, extensive estates, and never even met the personal representative who never even came here to Colorado. Are there any other questions or concerns that people would like to bring up? This is your golden opportunity, as Skip mentioned, to bring up those kinds of questions that might be on your mind or your heart. If not, I would like to encourage everybody to um, take the survey that we will be sending out it looks like there's be another there's another question that just came up, so I will stop talking and let you take that, Skip. Well, uh, the question was where can we obtain the smart book, and it's something that I do, <laughs> so you can come to me. That, I, that's not to say that there aren't others that are out there commercially. This is just when I do estate planning, I always give that to people. There, there are other parts of it. For example, uh, uh, some people may have a lot of firearms, and um, uh, they pass away, and by the time you get into the house, they're all gone. Uh, and unfortunately, all too often, things like that happen. So uh, this gives you an opportunity to make sure that your personal representative uh, knows what you have. And so there's a whole pages of firearms and uh, uh, the serial numbers and everything that are on them, uh, things like valuable artwork. Uh, where you go into a house where somebody's passed away and there's this sudden bright spot on the wallpaper where uh, the beautiful piece of art used to hang and isn't there anymore. By doing something like this, you can, you can at least let your fiduciaries know that there is something like that. Uh, can you create a will without a lawyer? Yes, you can. Um, there's another, I have a very good friend of mine, um, uh, Steve Azell. 
Uh, we probably do a, a lot of the litigation around. And we always say that, you know, come Christmas time, we ought to send something to Zoom wills and, uh, and some of these other um, uh, do-it-yourself wills. And I'm not trying to, to say this because, you know, obviously I, uh, you know, I, you pay me to do estate planning. But if you don't understand what that what the significance is of some of the questions that are asked you could come up with a frankenstein's monster of a will and that's not just a remote possibility in most cases i would say it's a very near certainty um i once for fun of it went into i think it's zoom wills or what's what's the one that uh, can't think of the other one now but in any event i went into it and i went through it and I intentionally blocked out everything I know as an estate planning attorney and just answered the questions as honestly as I could without knowing the context. And I ended up with the Frankenstein's monster. It would have been horrible. Uh, and when that happens, when you have a will like that, where you haven't anticipated some of the, uh, some of the likely consequences of that will, it's gonna end up in court. And the few hundred dollars that you will have saved will be sucked up in no time at all. Um, now, from somebody, does the JAG office perform these various documents for veterans? Yes, it does. And if you have a simple impact family um, uh, where it's just husband and wife and children, uh, then that's a good place to go. But uh, as a former JAG for many, many years, uh, JAGs are lawyers, they're not necessarily estate planning lawyers, and if you have any irregular verbs, um, that's not the place to go. But if it's a very simple will, and it's uh, mom and dad and kids, yeah, they sure do. Someone wants to know where you're located, Skip. Oh, um, Actually, uh, I think you're going to get the, the slides. And, uh, right. and the first slide is, uh, uh, has my contact information on it, uh, since we're not distributing cards. Um, but uh, in terms of convenience, I, I live, uh, I, I practice out of an office. What you're looking at in my background is my office. It's a guest cottage, which is located behind my house, which is at the northwest corner of Cascade and San Miguel. So there's uh, nothing to park and it's real easy to do, but you give me a call and Jane, my wife, uh, will get you an appointment. Uh, and then Dennis wants to know, would that be retirees or veterans in general? I think generally speaking, it's going to be retirees only. Uh, there's a limited amount of uh, availability of JAGs and uh, at least the last I checked it is for retirees only and in some cases not even that anymore. Um, JAGs are very busy these days and uh, legal assistance has um, unfortunately sort of fallen by the wayside for a lot of them. Do all lawyers charge pretty much the same amount to draw up a will? No. <laughs> no they don't. Um, most of you have probably seen some of these uh, you know, come to a free filet mignon dinner and, and, uh, and, you know, we'll talk about the five biggest estate planning mistakes. Um, if you're going there for dinner, uh, you may be on the menu because what happens there is that people sell a living trust. And the living trust makes a lot of sense in a lot of the states. Uh, and people are charging five, six thousand dollars for that. Um, and as a rule, something like that, which is just kind of mass produced, uh, is, it's not going to be particularly useful. It's going to be cumbersome, but it's for sure going to be expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to plug myself shamelessly for a minute. When you do estate planning with me, you're talking to me. You're not talking to a, an assistant who's just selling you a big notebook, uh, full of all kinds of estate planning documents that you don't need. So there's a question. Uh, still trying to figure out where to put my will. Um, it, it depends. 
if, if, if it's husband and wife, um, then obviously you want to keep the original wills in your possession in some fashion. Uh, you don't want those things to be burned up in the same, in the same fire with you. Uh, fireproof safes, we have learned, are not. Uh, if we learn nothing else from Waldo Canyon and from the Black Forest Fire, it is that documents did not survive even if they were in fireproof safes because the safes got so hot that they just incinerated inside the safe. Um, it's not a bad idea to keep the original with your alternate personal representative, which is to say usually one of the adult kids, because then if something happens to you, they have the original. Uh, on the other hand, if something happens to the will, you can redo it and you still have an original. Uh, there's nothing wrong with putting it in a uh, safe deposit box, provided that you have told uh, uh, your, your children or whoever your fiduciaries are that that's where it is and that the credit union or bank knows that's where it is. Um, that's, that's just kind of a rule of thumb. So, uh, and if you just said, so, so we have just, have just kids, put it, go ahead and put it into a safety deposit box along with other important things. Just make sure the kids know it's there uh, and can get into it. So somebody wants to know how much does it cost for a straightforward will? When I do estate planning, it's, um, I typically do four documents like you might have seen there. Uh, the will, the uh, medical power of attorney, the general power of attorney and the living will. Uh, and I also give you the smart book and it's usually for simple wills, it's usually less than a thousand dollars for husband and wife. And I encourage you if, uh, to go ahead and shop around and see how much anybody else charges. I missed the first part of that, Skip. What were you saying uh, about the charge or the fee? Yeah, um, I do four documents, the will, the living will, and the two powers of attorney, and then the, you know, the smart book. And usually for a husband and wife that does not involve elaborate trust provisions or anything, I think it's going to be less than $1,000. Anybody else? Uh, we're getting close to 5.30, but we still have a few minutes left. If there's a burning question or concern. If not, if not, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and, and close. And thank you very much, Skip, for all of your knowledge and your patience to go through all of this again with us. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, I know that the Area Agency on Aging is, is very much looking forward to uh, oncoming uh, seminars that we'll have with the End Credit Union. And I wanna just say to all of you participants, please, please fill out the survey. You'll get that with, your, with the PowerPoint. And uh, Bree, did you have anything you wanted to say in closing? No, and it looks like there are several people thanking you in the comments, Skip. I just want to do the same. That was great information and a lot for us to think about as well. So thank you so much. You're more than welcome. With that, I guess we will conclude our presentation. Thank you all for being here today. Have a good evening.